And welcome to Let Him Talk. I'm Paul Dirienzo. We've got another great show in store for you. My guest is Professor Kimura. Welcome. It's been a while. You were here before. And uh, we're going to talk about, well, a lot of different things because uh, Professor Kimura is an expert on crime and criminals <laughs> and their psychology and how to rehabilitate people who are in bad circumstances in their lives. And you're a very courageous person, one of the most courageous people I know, because you will go inside a, a prison <laughs> with like 10 sex offenders in a circle sure. and counsel them. I wouldn't call it crazy. I'd call it a lot of fun. But <laughs> yeah, but it a is a lot of fun. It's interesting. Right? Yeah, well, it's interesting. what is you know we're going to get into. You're here to talk <laughs> about your project. Tell us about your project. Sure. Well, thank you for having me on the show, Paul. Sure. Always good to see you. Yeah. So I have started a correctional education academy at John Jay College of Criminal Justice, where I'm a professor. That's right across the street. Right, right? across the street. Exactly. Yeah, easy. Paul. Yeah. And yeah. what is the purpose of that academy? The purpose of the correctional education academy is to promote correctional education as a profession for students at John Jay. Mm -hmm. we, I discovered that there are no courses in any college or university in the United States that deal with correctional educational courses uh, except the two that I designed. Mm -hmm. One for the honors program, one for the uh, general students. And I teach the students what it's like to do what I do to be mm -hmm. a correctional educator. Now obviously many of the students at John Jay become police, they go into corrections as correctional officers or probation officers, parole officers, mm -hmm. things like that. Right. But we also need people to do what I do, which mm -hmm. is to go into the prisons and jails, go to the treatment centers, etc., and teach people coping skills and other types of cognitive skills, etc. Right. Yeah. So what, what are the type of, uh, we're not yeah. talking about somebody who jumped a turnstile here. We could, but not really, and yeah. that's not the type of person I usually work with. No. Right. You right. Will tell us right. a little bit about who you work with, the kind of folks you work with. So I work with a lot of drug offenders, mm -hmm. and I work a lot with people. Over the years, I've worked with sex offenders. I've worked with people who have murdered people, um, people who are convicted of violent crimes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what are you, uh, are we just looking back at your career, how would you judge, you know, it's always been nature versus nurture mm. with uh, with criminal behavior. I mean, okay. do, you, do you see like a, <laughs> is it running? in families or is it really a result of their uh, environment? Depends on the person. And the reality is that your question is great, but it's hard to answer. And the evidence is very uh, conflicted about that. In, in some cases, it definitely seems to run in families, particularly if you're talking about certain types of mental illness and how it promotes criminal behavior. But on the other hand, if sometimes people are involved in certain types of opportunities, they're going to do things they're not supposed to be doing. Right, right. Yeah. And uh, let's talk about like the, some of the worst of the worst these days who seem yeah. in this political environment to be surrounded by sex offenders. I mean, when mm. we have governors, candidate, people who could have been presidents, we have presidents who grab mm. them by the this and the that. I mean, yeah. oh, I mean, the president is a sex offender by a lot of definitions for saying that, right? That would get, you know... Oh, sure. Sure. I mean, that's yeah. a, if he said that to a specific person, right. or he actually did grab somebody physically right. in Correct. that way, in a sexual manner, right. that's one way, that's a, that's a, you get on their list, we'll be looking up his name on the internet. Well, yeah, and it, I think the point you're trying to make is that... <coughs> Good, I, so I'm glad you saw it. <laughs> yeah, we, we see a lot of this behavior, but a lot of it has to do with how the media portrays them as well. Yeah. <coughs> Excuse me, so... Uh, when I worked with sex offenders years ago, this is back in 95, right, right after I got my PhD in education from the University of Minnesota, yeah. I was working in a prison in Minnesota which had two buildings exclusively designed to house sex offenders, so I worked with them for about a year and a half. And um, that was a big thing then too. I, I guess, you know, I'm going out of the limb by saying this. But I would say that our country has a real problem with understanding sexuality and uh, sex offenders and mixing all this up and confusing all these issues. And the reality is we're a very violent country. And one of the ways that we manifest violence is through sexual uh, attacks on people. It's like a form of domination, of violent it domination. It is, yeah, it is. And uh, I'm glad that people are talking about it mm -hmm. more. But, I mean, there are some controversial issues with it, too. Um, right. Well, what is it, like, yeah. is there a difference between <coughs> sex offense and just somebody has a Victorian sexual m mentality and just, sure. you know, can't deal with somebody who's more libertarian or libertine and sure. claims you're sexually, ha is that the same thing or can it be? No, there's a continuum of sex yeah. offenders and, and so sex offenses. 
<clears throat> and also it's defined differently in different states. And you know, it's, it's also based on cultural norms and how mm. we, what we tolerate and what we don't yeah, tolerate. Right. And people confuse the two all the t- a lot. They do all the time. They I do see, all the time incessantly, and it's right. hard to because right. if they somebody has a cultural, maybe they came from a country which is very more, especially New York, where it's very international, Correct. and they come from a country where Victorian morals are the order of the day. Right. And then they meet some New York guy who's like you know, or some person from uh, another country like Sweden or. Denmark Denmark, or right. where they kiss you in the street and like you know right. grab you and hug you, right. and that brings me to our a pre- potential presidential candidate right. who smelled people's hair. Right, right. right. Joe right. Biden. Correct. That's what I was thinking of. Right, and part of this also I think stems from a lack of respect for women, but also a lack of respect for themselves. Mm-hmm. And Julian Assange. Yeah. It turned out right. Right. I don't know exactly what happened, but basically. This girl liked him. He took her home, and there was another girl in the bed, and right. he was going to get into a three-way with them. And the girl right. said, "I didn't sign up for this. What are you bringing me?" Th-? You right. know, and that right. whatever happened after that is murky. Right. But that was the source of it. Right. Right. Absolutely. And so here's a guy who's just a jerk. <laughs> or, <you know>. Right. <laughs> right. Right. So, well, I but that is that a sexual offense? Right. Well, being a jerk. Well, it or creepy. Yeah. Well, it's all defined differently by social norms and how yeah. people look at it. But the bottom line, I feel, as a woman and as a feminist, is that it's very important for people to respect women. And if they say no, they mean no. And and uh, you know, I get this argument sometimes with people when I talk to them about, it and they'll say, "Well, what is this about this Me Too movement where women are standing up and saying that this guy shouldn't have done whatever? And why did it take women so long to say something?" And I say to them. You know, if you're uh, starting out as a model or you're a wa- young woman in some field and somebody who's very well known mm-hmm. is asking you to come to the hotel, if you're naive enough, you might actually do that. And then if he takes advantage of you, that's not appropriate. So right. people also need to learn that, you know, you don't go to somebody's hotel room when you are making some kind of deal. but. You know, and unfortunately, some men, not all, some men uh, don't act appropriately. We have to be very clear about ethics and boundaries. Right. So they were talking about the legal thing and then yeah. ethics and boundaries, Correct. which is another thing Correct. that doesn't necessarily rise up to the illegal actions, Correct. but does, does definitely affect our society. Oh, no question about it, because I think... It's more common, maybe. It is more common, but the other part of it, too, I think that's important to understand, Paul, is that it makes people feel like they can't, they, some people have said to me, well, I can't hug somebody anymore, or I can't mm-hmm. look at somebody a certain way, or I'm going to get accused of something, right, and right. somebody's going to file a complaint, and then there's no discussion, all of a sudden In there's the a lawyer involved. definitely. Correct. And, and so, Could happen. one no of the workplace. things that I do is teach people who are getting out of prison about workplace violence and workplace protocol so that they don't sexually harass people. Mm-hmm. You know, if somebody's been locked up for a long time, they don't even know what is going on in terms of sexual harassment laws. Right, right. And of course, the morality of 20 years ago is different from today. I Correct. Mean, what what uh, Correct. people, what guys and girls did in 1977 Madison, Wisconsin, right. is way different than Correct. what's appropriate today. Correct, correct. But again, I would go back to what you and I were alluding to before, which is there needs to be more respect between human beings. Mm-hmm. And if I don't respect myself, why would I respect anybody else? Then I would bother right. someone uh, as well, and that's not right. appropriate. Now, okay, so that's interesting. I wanted to get to that because it's, it's on everybody's mind. It's sure. on everything on mine because it's, you know, Me Too movement. Right. You know, do, w- do you ever say Me Too? Did you say, did you hashtag Me Too? Oh, uh, well, I... I guess now, you, uh, you know, hey, ever, did it ever happen to you that you had to say Me Too? Like, um, me yeah, too? I don't talk about it but um, it's it's uh, yeah I just don't talk about it but it, I, you know I, I think we'd be pretty hard pressed to not find a woman that hasn't had some kind of yeah, subjugation me too situation yeah, right, right, which right. is not necessarily sexual but it could right. be just domineering oh, and, yeah. and all those kind of things right oh, yeah. nasty and domineering and all this kind of against right. the woman well everybody else is just one of the guys correct it's that Correct. atmosphere. Oh yeah, hey buddy, how you doing? No, get a, you know, get me my coffee. You know, right. Or you're fired. You know what's interesting, Paul? If I could say this real yeah. quick, it's yeah, not a s- s- say it slow. Oh, okay, it's <laughs> not a yeah, it's not an issue of sexual harassment. But I think another manifestation of what we're talking about mm-hmm. is how people like myself in positions of authority, yeah. working with other people in authority, sometimes have to really speak up. So in other words, what am I trying to say? If I'm in, and I'm not saying all men are like this, because many men are very mm-hmm. gracious and, and right. loving and, and considerate and professional, but yeah. sometimes I run into men 
who are in a meeting and if I'm the only woman present, I have to speak louder and start interrupting them to be heard because mm -hmm. they just naturally just talk over me. Right. And I don't know if it's because I'm a woman or what it is, but you start, you know, here's the other thing. It starts this, and I wouldn't say paranoia, but I guess that's the best word. You start feeling like, well, why is it that they get to talk and dominate and I can't? I'm not trying to dominate them, but I also want to be heard. Yeah. And I think that's another manifestation of just sexism in general. Mm -hmm. That's the real problem, right. is sexism, uh -huh. in terms of a lot of what we're talking about. The, the idea that women Correct. are like the little lady, the little lady, uh, get the coffee, uh, Correct. sit and listen. You have so much to learn from us right. men who are so advanced right. compared right. to you. And you are a full professor, PhD, right. teaching it for 20 years, blah, right. blah, blah. Right. All right. So that also, that's interesting. So tell us again more about this uh, academy you want to set up and why you want to set it up. Well, I want to set this Correctional Education Academy up not only to promote the field of correctional education as a profession for students, but also I want to promote the field of correctional education. It's been around, but it hasn't really been framed correctly mm -hmm. in my mind. So mm -hmm. in other words, why do I say this? We don't have enough people who are in prison being educated. And so because they're not being educated, whether a sex offender or any kind of, of person in there, they're not being educated enough. And so when they get out and they go back into society, which most do, the chances of recidivating are very high because they don't know what their options are. Mm -hmm. They don't have a degree. They are not educated about certain issues. And so they end up going back in. And I want to eliminate mm -hmm. recidivism in this country, right. which I is a tall order. Uh, so res what is recidivism? Well, recidivism is the is the risk and then the, the action of actually going back to prison or jail. In mm -hmm. other words, committing another crime, getting convicted of it, and being sent back where they right. were before. Right. Is it, uh, you know, I remember a, a, a TV show about a, a guy who got out of prison, escaped from prison with a friend of his, and the friend was homicidal, and the other guy, they wound up getting involved in a robbery and taking hostages and surrounded by the police, and one of the two helped the police arrest his friend, right. and he looked to the cop, and the cop said, why did you do that? And he said, I do better in jail. <laughs> I hear that quite often. You know, jail is better, I do better in jail. Yeah. You want to hear something bizarre. <coughs> Excuse me. I was working at Sing Sing once, and this was a while. This was probably about 10 years ago. And I looked up one day, Paul, in the classroom, and there was a guy at the door that they were bringing in. And I said to him, I said, hello, so-and-so. What are you doing here? And he said, well, I committed a crime again and got convicted of it. And I said, well, obviously. And I said, why? He says, well, I wanted to learn from you. And I said, you mean you wanted to commit a crime so you could come back in here? And, you know, I mean, that's silly. Right. And they'll also say that they want to come back to jail or prison because they function better there. Some of them feel that they really do because there's a certain amount of order to it. When you let people out of prison, they don't have the proper cognitive skills to function. Yeah. Many times they just don't know what to do with their unstructured time. Society doesn't know how to take care of them. I felt that way, and I, you know, I remember it took a while to learn what to do. I mean, when sure, I was younger, sure. I felt that way often. Like, sure. what do I do with my unstructured time right. while I'm out here? Right. I mean, I see a lot of people when I'm shooting heroin and doing a lot of dope right. and stuff like that. You know, that's right. That's one way to deal with it. Right. Right? Right. But you have to think of something constructive to Correct. do with your time, or else destructive habits will take over. Absolutely, not in all cases, but invariably, uh, yeah. I guess you're right. But yeah, I don't yeah. know if I'm right. <laughs> well, I just know. Yeah, yeah. It just needs to be. It's a lot, as you said, everybody's different, isn't it? it yeah, and that's what also makes it tricky. Um, but what, what I don't like is the way much of the public categorizes people and says, oh, they shouldn't be educated. Mm -hmm. But what's interesting is, you know, yesterday in the Forbes magazine, if I may quote, this yes was the uh, Forbes magazine, uh, April 15th, they have an article in there that basically says that w Congress should pass the REAL Act, the R-E-A-L Act. Mm -hmm which is Restoring Education and Learning Act. And the reason I bring that up is that if the public understood how educating people could reduce their taxes, make their s communities safer, make people more productive and feel better about themselves mm -hmm. so they don't reoffend, that would be great. Uh -huh. You know, and... and uh, so rehabilitation, yeah. but a lot of American prison science is the, doesn't care about rehabilitation. No, right? it a doesn't. Punishment. No, it doesn't. It's a punishment thing. It's like, a lot of times they say, we don't care if you get rehabilitated. We don't care what happens no. to you. We're here to punish you for five years or eight years or right. three years or two years or whatever. Right. It's, it's all a, about that idea of safety and control. Is that what you find I as well? I, f I find that a lot. It's it's that idea of punishment that you're talking about. Yeah. And the idea, too, that um, it's pointless to educate. And basically... Having prisons around is also a big money maker. There's no question about that. Mm -hmm. But it also is there because 
many people in the public live in a tremendous amount of fear of the unknown and thinking, oh, I've got so-and-so next to me, so I don't want to deal with that. And, and you know, the media just blows all of this out of proportion. It makes people feel they're... Well, you said America is a violent country, though. It is, but I believe, and this is harder to prove, but one of the reasons it's so violent is because if you and I sat in front of the TV right now and we flipped about 150 stations, you know, as Bruce Springsteen used to talk about, <laughs> we would find one thing after another that's violent. Mm -hmm. and oh my God, there's nothing that isn't. Right. And, you know, I teach, you. I teach English second language. I have many students from all over the world right. and they are absolutely shocked every time I turn on the TV to show them a program about America. They can't believe it. West, you can't get away from it. Every Western, every cop yeah. show, every detective show, right. even romances have some scene where somebody pulls a gun. I mean, right. in some point, even if right. the whole movie is like a chick flick romance, right. there's a gun scene somewhere buried in it. We're a very violent country in that regard. You know, you know this as well as I know, and I suspect your audience knows this, uh, this as well, that in Canada, many people don't even lock their doors to their home. Yeah. They are not living in fear. And they have guns. Who, right, and yeah. they, right, but it's a mentality that goes with it. Right, it's not just, in a way, that's an argument. I'm not saying, I'm not taking a position one way or other on gun control. I don't think you can... You know what's funny is that you can control guns. They did it in this country plenty of times. Right. Try and wander into a uh, western town with a sign out front that said no uh, guns allowed. Right. You know, and right. see what happens to you. Right. There were plenty of towns in the old west like that sure. where no guns were allowed. Uh, they didn't allow no cowboys in there without guns. The microphone. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. The microphone. Whoops. Let me fix this. Okay. Here, just take the clip. Just to, yeah, remove the clip. Oh, yeah. Like that. Okay. And then I'm going to put it here. Okay. That's all right, and then you can replace it. See, this is okay. live rate, live television. <laughs> <laughs> We're having fun. Yeah. All right. That's fine. Just like that, it's fine. Okay. Great. Very good. Thank you. Good. No problem. And so, um, so, well, I forgot we we got this. Well, what I'm fascinated by all of this because we have this era now of they're talking about re re uh, reforming justice, criminal justice, right. letting a lot of people out of jail, legalizing marijuana. Right. Um, uh, decriminalizing a lot of things that used to be criminalized, whether whether it's prostitution or uh, right. uh, these these victim, so-called victimless crimes, um, and uh, having no bail, maybe even reduce getting rid of bail, so people are just going right. to you know be signed an OR and be out on most crimes, unless it's a crime of violence. Right. What do you think about these? Uh, and this is happening. Even the Republicans are supporting <coughs> this. Why is that? Why do you think you were in the, on the inside? Why is what, what finally got even right wingers to believe that it was time? I think one of the big reasons that that happened is because the Pew Institute, PEW, in 2008 came out with a great study that basically said that one out of a hundred adults in this country have been incarcerated, and so that makes you realize, wait a minute, I probably know somebody that's locked up and. My point in saying this, Paul, is that because so many people have been affected in this country and because this country incarcerates at a higher rate than anywhere in the world, it's in our face so much now that people are saying, wait a minute, we have to do something because that's right. my whatever, that's my, you know, some right. relative, somebody I know down the street. And it's just too hot a mirror, I think, right now. Right. Plus and it, yeah. what was the source of this? Was fear? We were talking earlier oh, no about question. fear. No question. No right? question. And the fear came in part from the media right. situation we were talking about, where there's violence right. all around us in the media. Right. Uh, now I was, you know, t this the twentieth is the uh, anniversary. I think the tenth anniversary, twentieth anniversary of the shooting in Columbine. Right. It's twenty years. This twentieth, yeah. I think. Right. And you know, we they at the time they told us all these reasons why Klebold and the other one committed all these crimes. They said they were part of the trench coat mafia, they right. were goths, they were bullied, um, they uh, had mental problems. They went through a whole list. And then it turned out that was all false. In fact, 20 years later, not only were those all myths, but the, the reason was that both of them were deep into Nazi and neo-Nazi politics. And it didn't come out for 20 years right. that they were neo-Nazis. Right. Right, and that's really interesting too. Yeah, it, the, these cases are complicated because we're not in those people's heads. Yeah. But I will say from all my work that I do that there was no question those two were mentally ill because many people have guns. And that doesn't mean they do that. Many people get depressed. It doesn't yeah. mean they do that. Uh, but the, but let's go back to what you're talking about because that's important too. This neo-Nazism is is terrible. You know, when I look at that, I equate that with sexism and homophobia and racism, all this stuff. 
anytime somebody doesn't respect themselves, mm -hmm. as I mentioned before, they are much more apt to hurt somebody else. Mm -hmm. And so when I, I, as a correctional educator, spend an inordinate amount of time working with people in prison and on parole and probation, teaching them that they need to respect themselves. Because when these people get out, if they don't respect themselves, they will come at people mm -hmm. in various ways. What are they trying to do when they come at, at people, as you say? Well, they'll steal, they'll kill, they'll rape, they'll, they'll lie, they'll do all these things that, you know, disrupt society. Who cares? I don't care about myself, why should I care about you? Correct. You and got something I want, I'm going to take it. Correct. But what I have discovered in all these years, decades, that I've devoted to teaching them, I have discovered that many of them are amazing leaders and many of them are extremely intelligent and if they're just given the opportunity to educate and to recognize neo-nazism is not the way to go mm -hmm. being homophobic is not appropriate because of this this and this if they get educated a lot of them wake up and they start wanting to repent what's wrong with our educational system that they didn't educate them in the first place i mean everybody has to go to school for at least 16 years i well, mean you know, the 16 basic years old. problem i feel of, man it's a huge issue but the basic problem i feel is that from the time people were young they were not learning basic critical thinking skills in other words people were not taught how to be fair-minded mm -hmm. critical thinkers right. so that means they're not learning how to be honest they're not learning the difference between a fact and an opinion they're not looking at the fact that you matter as much as I do but you're not better than me and I'm not better than you and then I need to listen to you and that it's okay to disagree but we need to come to a point where we say wow is this good for us and community we don't learn that in school yeah. we learn how to spit back facts don't question Especially authority. Especially now more than ever. Correct. And don't question authority. How many right. times do I see students in classes in many different situations in New York sitting in the dark looking at a PowerPoint presentation that somebody is giving at a training or a class somewhere and they're doing this. Right. Or they're sleeping because there's, there's no, a PowerPoint up there. They do it in my, I, you know, I teach, you know, in, yeah. in, in the mornings and, okay. and it amazes me. It's like right while I'm lecturing, they're like going away. And, you know, I could be you know, I'm not really paid to be an enforcer to make them stop. I try and sometimes embarrass them to a certain degree. Wow. But, uh, wow. you know, other cultures, uh, I won't go into, but some countries just, you know, the student is king of the classroom and they can pretty much do whatever they want. Mm. And it's not like in our more, much more authoritarian American system where the teacher is sort of can hit you and, you know, historically mm. and right. is the boss and can get you in a lot of trouble and right. you have to do what the teacher says or else. Right. A lot of countries aren't like that. They treat their kids like, deferentially right and they let them ru run wild and you know and they become like permanent students all the time right. they but they never achieve a goal like in our culture sometimes right I would say that the use of social media particularly that is something that I definitely don't allow in my classes I don't allow it and I say it in my syllabus I say if I see you with it you're absent so they don't do it <coughs> Here's the other thing that's interesting about social media. We're learning more and more that it plays with our mind and it kicks off, you know, it makes us think less about what's going on and to be more anxious, more depressed, mm -hmm. more socially isolated, which can lead to, you know, deleterious effects and crime could be one of them, which is not a good thing. But, you know, the, these things haven't been around long enough to really track all that. But yeah. all I know is that when I see somebody that's not connected with everybody else, feeling apathetic, disillusioned, depressed. I want to keep an eye on that person because I want people to feel connected and, and loved and respected by people. Mm -hmm. now, this doesn't do that. No, it no. doesn't, does it? No. Uh, so what's, uh, what, what is this all about? What is this all coming to as far as uh, last few minutes of the show? Um, it, do you have hope for the future of this country or are you losing hope? Well, some days I lose hope, uh, but then when I start working with people in prison again, uh, then I get hope. Because as I mentioned to you earlier, that is exactly where I feel the leadership of the planet is. I, and I think that's actually intentional as well. I think that there are many people that have been locked up in prisons and jails in this country simply because they defy authority, simply because they say this law is unjust, simply because they stand up for their rights, simply because they were in the wrong place at the wrong time, and somebody accused them of something they didn't do. And uh, when you educate them, it's really fun to watch. That transformation is positive. That gives me a lot of hope in this country. Mm -hmm. There's no question about that. So that it works. It, so it what, can. What, what, it can. what do we have to do? What do you think if you were <laughs> if you if you replace Betsy DeVos, mm. the most horrifying human being I have 
ever had the uh, to read her quotes mm. and what she says and how she's been leading education in this country. Mm. Uh, let's say you replaced her. You were the <laughs> Secretary of Education. Oh, that'd be great. You can you can help me get there, Paul. That's good. Well, I yeah, I would take every idea she has and throw it right out the window. Uh, we need to basically do this, I think, in terms of education across the board, no matter who it is. People need to learn how to become fair-minded critical thinkers so that we can learn to respect each other, so we can look at facts, have mm -hmm. opinions, but base our opinions on facts. Yeah, but isn't Not critical thinking how, how troublemaking reds and, uh, tr and uh, protester types... Not unless they're self-serving or they're uncritical. ...get into our, our youth right. and get them protesting instead mm -hmm. of studying? No, no well, see, here's the, here's the interesting thing about that. There are, and I know we're running out of time, so I'll say it quickly. There are three types of critical thinkers. There are uncritical thinkers, those who don't value learning at all. So they're not, they're not learning or they don't understand the importance of learning. There's um, self-serving critical thinkers. Some, not all, politicians are like that, mm -hmm. right? So if- They're if plotting you, and planning for their own benefit. Correct, right, or if Manipulating money- Manipulating people. Correct. Seeing the, the uh -huh. difference in intelligence between them and another and saying- That's right, ah, ah, ah. what can I get from that person? Yeah, right. And then there's that third type of person, which is a fair-minded critical thinker, and that's the hardest to be because that means I have to be ethical 24-7. And that's what I teach people in prison, mm -hmm. and that's what I teach others to do in my right. classes. You have to police yourself in a way. Yeah. You have to say to yourself, yeah. you have an opportunity to, to take that last ice yeah. cream bar out of the freezer. That's right. Or the last beer out of that six-pack. That's right. And after you've had two, right. and there's two other people, right. and you say no. Right, and there's that question of what is right and wrong, and then that's another whole discussion. Right. Oh, <laughs> what is right or wrong, right? <laughs> but it's a great discussion to have with them. So. Right, right. Last minute, again, tell us a little bit about what you're planning to do and how we can help. Well, thank you, Paul. Uh, with the Correctional Education Academy, I want to promote correctional education in this country so that more and more students who are involved in criminal justice courses go into correctional education as a profession so they do what I do. It's not about yeah. me, but it's about people going into prisons and jails and educating people about cognitive skills so that we can have more people get out of prison and know how to function to cope better in mm -hmm. life. That would be a great thing to have. All right, great. And uh, and so you're still, you're at the Osborne, right? Can we yeah, I'm education that? director there yeah, too. Right, right, right. right. I love and it. we knew each other. We went to wow. school together at the University of Wisconsin. We did. Old friends, you know, we uh, went back to you the know. days of uh, the radical demonstrations we there did. in Madison, yep. Wisconsin, if yep. you know about that. And uh, Absolutely. we met on the student government where yes. I was a student senator and she was the vice president of right. the student government. Right. And uh, we were involved in a lot of very interesting activities. We that's were. That's for sure in those we days, were. right? Yeah. Very aware school in those days. Oh, was. It definitely, right. definitely People was. were a lot more aware. But that's what we want to bring, that kind of critical thinking that made Madison so interesting in those Absolutely, days. Absolutely, Paul. And we'll see you next week. Thanks, Paul. That's it. We did it. Thank you. Watch out for your mic. Put it on okay. the back of the seat. Okay.